Welcome, Dr. Lastik. How are you today? Thanks very much for having me, Coco. Um, it's, a, it's a typical summer day in San Francisco, 50, raining, dank, foggy, yeah, uh, and it's June. Well, at least it's June. It's a little bit warmer than in other months of the year. Dr. Lassig, you've written a number of books, all bestsellers. Uh, I've always been thrilled by your work, like millions of people around the world. Your newest book, Metabolical, which I see here on screen, it's fascinating. One of the things that you bring up in the book is something that has been very controversial because for years we've been told that if we're fat, we eat too much. Are we eating too much or are we eating wrong? Why are we so fat? Well, we're eating too much and we're eating wrong, but neither of them are our fault. So in uh, the, the standard mantra from the doctors and the dietitians and the Institute of Medicine and the NIH and, and the White House and Congress and the food industry is you are what you eat. That's what everyone thinks. Uh, I wrote my first book back in 2013 called fat chance to basically dispel that notion. What I said was, you are what you do with what you eat. That metabolism is actually more important than calories. Well, the reason I had to write this book, this new book, Metabolical, is because in the last eight years, we've had the opportunity to sort of go underneath, you know, actually look at the underbelly of the food industry and how they put their uh, messaging together and ultimately realized that they knew what was going on at a very early stage back in the 1950s, even 1960s. And the fact is they knew that sugar was addictive and that when they added it, you bought more. And so, I mean, they could have added cocaine to the food, but you know, that was illegal, but sugar wasn't. Sugar was a legal addiction. And so what we've learned is that what I said back in 2013 was not even correct. And so I had to update it with all the new information, including all the politics. And so really what I now say is you are what they did with what you eat. In Dr. fact, Lassic, processing is more important. And in that line of thought, uh, chapter three of your book is so revealing. There you make a quote uh, regarding uh, diabetes and the Diabetes Center, the CEO, Ron, Ron Kian, saying that, and I quote, sugar, in fact, to a certain extent, it's okay because it stimulates the pancreas to make more insulin, which it actually helps to control blood sugar. Is that a statement relevant for us, the way we understand sugar? Is just sugar just fine? First of all, that statement isn't even remotely scientifically accurate. That statement is completely misleading. And to be honest with you, that statement should have gotten uh, Dr. Richard Kahn thrown out of his job for malpractice, except he'd already left it. That statement is perhaps the most egregious statement that could come from uh, a, uh, an executive of the American Diabetes Association. Sugar is not okay. Um, it does increase insulin secretion, but that doesn't mean it controls your blood sugar. And the problem with sugar, dietary sugar, is something that has nothing to do with controlling your blood sugar. It has to do with the fructose molecule. Now, for your listeners, sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee, is sucrose, all right? You can get it from cane, you can get it from beets, it is two molecules, not one, two. One's called glucose, one's called fructose, and they are bound together. High fructose corn syrup, which is what's found in, say, sodas and chewy cookies, are one glucose, one fructose, not bound together. That's the big difference. Now, glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. The Inuit, you know, the Eskimos, they didn't have any place to grow a carbohydrate. They had whale blubber, all right? They still had a serum glucose level even though they didn't consume glucose because their liver would take 
fatty acids or amino acids and turn it into glucose in order to be able to power the body and particularly the brain. So while glucose is necessary for life, it is not necessary to consume for life. Big difference. Now, fructose, this other molecule, the sweet molecule, the molecule that's addictive, there is no biochemical reaction in the body that requires. It is completely vestigial to all vertebrate life on this planet. It is a holdover from our plant ancestors. It's why they're plants and we're not. In fact, you do not need any fructose. Now, we do have an innate capacity to metabolize a little bit of it, just like we have an innate capacity to metabolize a little bit of alcohol. But if you overdose, you get sick. So you can get sick acutely, you know, and wrap your Lamborghini around a tree, or you can get sick chronically and get cirrhosis of the liver and die from that. Well, fructose does not make you wrap your Lamborghini around a tree. It just makes you irritable. But it causes the same uh, cirrhosis that uh, alcohol does. And it does it for the same reason. So the fructose molecule is the problem in sugar, having nothing to do with glucose and having nothing to do with glucose control. So Dr. Kahn's statement that you need sugar and that it's a little bit, it's okay, is actually uh, completely off topic, not to the point, and actually quite egregious. And it, I would love to debate him and basically hand his head to him. Along those lines, and uh, that statement that, that was made is very confusing because the average diabetic person will go to the American Diabetic Society and they will look up what, what's normal. I mean, what am I supposed to trust? But understanding what you said, that fructose is really the, the culprit here. Where is fructose? Why are we living in an epidemic of over-fructosing ourselves, if we may call it that way? So... so. Fructose is found in fruit. Fructose is the reason that fruit is sweet. Glucose is sweet, but not that sweet. Um, glucose is like molasses. Mol molasses are basically what glucose tastes like. Um, glucose is like what Cairo syrup is. Okay? You don't see people going around chugging Cairo syrup, do you? I mean, it might be good in an apple pie or a pecan pie, but, you know, it's not something that's overly consumed and abused. Same with molasses. That's straight glucose. It's sweet, but not that sweet. So where would this come from? So fr fructose is very sweet. Okay. It's three times as sweet as glucose. It comes from fruit because fruit has sucrose. It has glucose, fructose bound together. All right. The reason that fruit is okay is because of the fiber. So fruit has fiber. All fruit has fiber. Some have more fiber than others. The two that don't have much fiber are grapes and bananas. And those are actually the two that are somewhat problematic because they don't have enough fiber. But in general, the rest of all the fruits, the amount of fructose in the fruit correlates with the amount of fiber in the fruit. An example, sugar cane. Sugar cane is a stick. You can't even chew the damn thing because there's so much fiber. It happens to have the highest sucrose concentration. That's why it's sugar cane. But you practically have to suck the stuff out. You don't get very much unless, of course, you put it in a pot still and, you know, crystallize it out. And then you sell it in five pound bags of white sugar that you buy at the grocery store. All right. So the fructose is found in fruit, which is why it's called fruit sugar or fructose. I mean, that's where the word comes from, All right? But it is um, offset by the fiber in the fruit. Now, if you take that, and the reason the fiber offsets it is because in the intestine, the fiber will form a gel on the inside of the intestine. And you need both fibers, soluble and insoluble. The insoluble fibers like the stringy stuff in celery, the soluble fibers like the pectins, like what holds jelly together, and they're globular and they plug the holes in that lattice work that the cellulose makes up. Together, the two form this gel on the inside of the intestine and block absorption 
from the gut into the bloodstream. So even though you consumed it, even though it passed your lips, because of the fiber in the fruit, it actually never got absorbed. It stayed in your gut and goes further down the intestine where the bacteria will chew it up for its purposes. So you will have protected your liver because of the gel and you will have fed the gut because you will have moved the food through the intestine for the bacteria to be able to, cons to, to uh, metabolize it themselves. So you were basically feeding your gut. So fruit is good. Juice is not. And because what happens with juice is you have put it in a Vitamix or a Breville or a Magic Bullet or whatever it is that you use to make the juice, you know, smoothies or whatever. And what will have happened is that the blades of the uh, machine will have sheared the insoluble fiber into such little itty bitty pieces that it can't form that lattice work in order to make that gel. And so the um, uh, fructose will still get absorbed just as rapidly. And so you will not be protecting your liver and you will not be feeding your gut. So fruit is good, juice is bad. Now, the food industry does not want to tell you that because they're not selling fruit, they're selling juice. Processed food is not fruit because fruit goes bad on the shelf. There's a depreciation to fruit. But once you squeeze it and freeze it, it lasts forever. And you can sell it on the commodities market, frozen concentrated orange juice. All right. So this is how they make money. This is how they reduce depreciation. Good for them, bad for you. So you make a very good point. And uh, I am a mother of four children. I remember when they were in daycare going to the school fighting with the people and saying, you cannot give my child juice and call it fruit. It's not one serving of fruit what you're giving him. You're giving him a metabolical disaster. And I personally, because I'm a little feisty, I sued that specific daycare because I felt that they had to respect my wishes as I was a paying parent. But I feel that a lot of parents, sometimes they are in, in this situation that they are told that it's okay. Now, moving all this great information into the community that listens and views these videos, most of them are either from uh, American Latino descent or they are living in other countries like Mexico or any South American country. In your book, you talk about different aspects. I mean, there are so many that it'd be impossible. That's why I want anybody that reads English to get Dr. Lassick's book, Metabolical, and hopefully will be available in Spanish soon. I haven't asked you if that's going to happen. Well, we'll need a publisher who's willing to do that. And thus far, we've not, no, no Spanish uh, uh, language publisher has uh, approached us. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that because this is a channel that most Spanish people <laughs> listen for help millions of them. So hopefully we'll find a good publisher. But in your opinion, uh, with this confusion that exists for parents, now we have to interact that with the descendant of the, the American Latino or the Latino population. In your book, you talk about certain genomas, morpheus changes uh, uh, that have not adapted to these high fructose uh, foods. What happens when somebody from Latino descent has, you know, orange juice for breakfast, a bowl of cereal, a sandwich for lunch with a little bit of soda, and just this overload of sugars. So first you have to understand what fructose does to your liver. So as I think I mentioned before, fructose and alcohol, we have a limited capacity to metabolize them. What happens if your liver sees too much of either one? fructose or alcohol? The answer is your liver has a set of enzymes in it that metabolize energy and you overwhelm those enzymes. They are basically flooded with a tsunami of either sugar or alcohol, doesn't matter, either one. The liver can't handle the load, so it converts the excess into fat, all right? So you've turned sugar into fat. You've turned alcohol into fat. And this is where fatty liver comes from. And America now has an epidemic 
of fatty liver disease, but it's really not an epidemic. It's a pandemic because every other country has it also. Not as bad as us. 45% of Americans have fatty liver disease today. 25% of Europeans, 25% of Asians have fatty liver disease today. This was a disease never even seen before 1980. If you had fatty liver before 1980, you were an alcoholic. Today, children get fatty liver disease. 20% of children in America have fatty livers and they don't drink alcohol. And the reason is because sugar and alcohol are metabolized identically in the liver. And so it should make, you know, be no surprise to anyone that kids get the diseases of alcohol without alcohol. Type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease were the diseases of alcohol until 1980, and now they're the diseases of children. And the children are the canaries in the coal mine. So when the liver is overwhelmed by excess sugar, which is what happens when you drink a glass of orange juice or eat a bowl of Fruit Loops. And that, by the way, is the National School Breakfast Program. All right. And it's seven times the upper limit of normal for sugar in a day. And it's just breakfast. So no wonder our kids are getting sick. The liver takes the excess and turns it into fat. Now, there are two transcription factors that are involved in that conversion. And in Latinos, and no one knows why this is, in Latinos, they have polymorphisms of those two transcription factors that put them at greater risk because a little sugar makes a lot of liver fat. And those two are called, well, first one's called PNPLA3, patatin-like phosphoprotein domain A3. Not important, but just so you know, it has a name. And the other one's called SLC16A11. So for reasons that are unclear, Native Americans of, that are Latino have uh, a higher risk for having the uh, uh, problem alleles for these two transcription factors. And if you have these, then a little sugar makes a lot of liver fat. And this is the reason that Latinos are much more uh, susceptible to fatty liver disease than either Caucasians or African Americans. And the problem is when you have fatty liver disease, that makes you insulin resistant, then your pancreas burns out because you're insulin resistant, your pancreas can't keep up with the, it, uh, the needs of the liver, and you end up with type 2 diabetes. And this is the reason that Latinos are particularly at greater risk for type 2 diabetes in America. It's because of their excess sugar consumption. So in your book, you talk about, because we know not everybody is going to have the funds or the ability or the interest or time to go and do a genetic test. You know, do I have these uh, polymorphisms? But you mentioned very easy uh, tools that we can use. I think there is five or seven tools that you can, things that you should know what to ask your doctor, because I love your chapter about re-educating the doctor, re-educating the dietitian. Pretty much we have to become our own practitioners. What are those tools that we can start using if we think, do I have fatty liver? And what should I ask my doctor to know that my lipid panel, my blood panel general is okay? All right. So, the first one, the cheap one, the easy one, the free one, is your waist circumference. Now, your waist circumference is not your liver fat, but they are closely related. So if you do a waist circumference, you're getting a reasonably good check on your liver fat. Normal waist circumference should be less than 40 inches for a male and less than 35 inches for a female. If they are higher than that, then there is a reasonably good chance you have fatty liver to go with it. And you can do it for free. All you have to know is your belt size. Now, it is sensitive, but it is not specific. There are other things that raise your waist circumference also. So sometimes you need a little bit more information and you can get more from lab tests. So what lab tests do you need or do your, does your doctor need in order to be able to figure this out? The best one, is called an ALT. ALT stands for alanine aminotransferase. 
This is a standard liver function test. You get it on a standard chem panel. The problem with it is that the normal range is wrong. So when I entered medical school, the upper limit for ALT was 25. Today, the upper limit for ALT is 40. How come? Same test. What happened? Why in 40 years, 45 years, did the upper limit go from 25 to 40? And the answer is because everyone has fatty liver disease now. The way you figure out a normal range is you do thousands of tests in people you think are healthy, and then you figure out what the mean and two standard deviations is, and that's where you draw the line and you say, okay, that's uh, too high. That's, that's your upper limit. The entire curve has shifted to the right over the last 45 years because now everyone has fatty liver because of the sugar. But of course, the lab doesn't know that. So they just say, well, the upper limit's 40. Hey, when I entered medical school, it was 25. What's changed? The answer is our food. And so now 40 is on the lab slip. No, 25 is still the upper limit of normal. And your doctor needs to know that. And that's another reason I wrote the book is so, so that your doctor would know that. So that's one test. A second test that's very useful is called uric acid. Now, uric acid is a proxy measure for protein consumption, but it's also a proxy measure for sugar consumption. Now, uric acid is one of the reasons that your blood pressure goes up. So when you have a high uric acid, that uh, causes uh, an uh, uh, inhibition of an enzyme in your blood vessels that lower your blood pressure. So if you inhibit it, it raises your blood pressure. So just a spoonful of sugar helps the blood pressure go up. I actually wrote a paper called that. Um, so um, uric acid is, go, normally goes out in the kidney. And a normal uric acid should be less than 5.5. But if you look at the lab slip today, the upper limit of normal for uric acid is 7.0. How did it get from 5.5 to 7.0? Same way. So, it, you know, your doctor needs to know not just what your uric acid is, they need to know what the normal range is in order to interpret it correctly. So these are two lab tests that are immediately available to you that will give you lots of information. The third one that is very important is your serum triglyceride. Now, everyone makes a big deal about the LDL. And it's true that LDL does correlate with heart disease. I don't argue that. But serum triglyceride actually correlates better the hazard risk ratio for LDL and heart disease is 1.3. The hazard risk ratio for triglyceride and heart disease is 1.8. So it is 50% better at predicting a heart attack even than LDL. And triglyceride, your serum triglyceride, is basically a manifestation of how much sugar you ate because that's where the triglyceride comes from is the conversion of sugar to triglyceride in the liver. So that's your best marker. And in fact, the triglyceride to HDL ratio <clears throat> is the poor man's measure of insulin resistance. And that's something you can get off the lipid profile that your doctor does also. So, so what should be that ratio? What, what are we looking at? What should be so, our triglyceride versus HDL? So our triglyceride to HDL ratio should be <clears throat> about 1.5. If it's over two, it might be an issue. And if it's over 2.5, chances are you have metabolic syndrome. So that's a pretty, pretty slight. So if I have my triglycerides at 100, which is upper limit, what do I need my uh, HDL to be at to, well, to, to compensate? Be, to be over 50. So it's a lot closer than we had been told even in the past of a ratio of one to five. If your triglycerides have that ratio, so it's, it's really narrowing it down. Oh, absolutely. So if you've got a triglyceride to HDL ratio of five, you've got a problem. So what you need to understand is what the triglyceride's telling you. What it's telling you is it's telling you what your liver's doing with your food. And you know, the LDL is a different issue. It's a different story. I'm not saying LDL is, not, uh, is useless. It's useful, but most of what's happened to us in terms of heart disease risk is actually through, because of the change in our triglyceride, which is because of the changes in our sugar consumption. So now we had the ALT, the uric acid, the serum triglyceride. What is the other 
tests that we should ask our doctors for? Well, there are some others. I mean, you can certainly ask for a serum homocysteine level. That's a little hard to get uh, and not nearly as uh, immediately available. Uh, there are some other tests like LP little a. Obviously, uh, you should get a hemoglobin A1C. The, that's the diabetes test. But the problem with that test is by the time it's changed, the horse is out of the barn. It's the last thing to change. So you don't want that. And then finally, the most important test is a fasting insulin. By far and away, the fasting insulin is the most important test to get. Now, the American Diabetes Association says, don't bother. I'm telling you that's wrong. That's just wrong. They tell you don't get a fasting insulin for two reasons. The first reason is they say, the test isn't standardized across laboratories. The reason is because cheap tests measure another hormone called pro-insulin. And pro-insulin is not as strong as insulin. But if your pancreas is putting out pro-insulin, that means it's under major stress. So it doesn't matter. If your insulin level is high, that's all you need to know. And that tells you that you've got metabolic problems. The second reason the ADA does not suggest drawing a fasting insulin is because fasting insulin does not correlate with obesity. That's true. It correlates with metabolic health, which is much more important. So in both cases, the ADA is you know, mi being misleading about the need for fasting insulin. I think it's the single most important test that people can do, that do but doctors need no to know how to interpret it. And that's the reason I wrote the book. So for those that are not so familiar with, uh, with testing insulin and hemoglobin A1C, what is the difference between hemoglobin A1C and insulin? between those two testing. So hemoglobin A1C basically tells you if you have diabetes. Fasting insulin tells you if you have metabolic dysfunction. So, so where the, do we want our insulin? Sorry? Where do we want our insulin levels? Oh, our fasting insulin should really be as low as possible, you know, preferably under two or under three. But the, you really only ask, you know, elite athletes, you know, can be that low. You know, the, the majority of us, you know, shall we say mortals, um, you know, a fasting insulin less than 10 is fine. Um, a, a fasting insulin greater than 15 starts to, you know, pretend uh, uh, concern and problems for the future. So knowing all these numbers, now we move this into a subject that it's of great interest for all of us children. You mentioned before that we have more than epidemic, a pandemic of kids all over the world. Just in the U.S. alone, 20 or over 20 percent of our children are young, sick adults. I mean, they're, they're just, they have livers that belong to a 70, 80 year old. Sure. What can you say as a parent? What, what can parents do? Because I feel sometimes that they're, we as parents feel paralyzed with so much information. Where do you begin? Um, three words, three words, eat real food. Now the problem is what's real food is Cheetos food. That's my question. If you think Cheetos is food, then basically you're sunk. Okay. Because you won't be able to dig yourself out. And part of the reason I wrote the book is to explain what food is. What the you know, consumer packaged goods industry, the CPG industry is selling you is not food. It's poison. Some and the question is, how do I know that? I mean, after all, it's got calories. It's, they might even have laced it with vitamin C or vitamin D or something. Why do you call it poison? In order for a food to be healthy, it has to satisfy two criteria. Protect the liver. Feed the gut as we talked about earlier with the fiber. Foods that protect the liver and feed the gut are healthy, but those are, that's real food. Foods that starve, that, that, sorry, flood the liver and starve the gut are poison. And that's what processed food does. They added sugar for palatability, that floods the liver. They took the fiber out for shelf life, that starves the gut. So basically a low sugar, high fiber diet is healthy. That's called real food. A high sugar, low fiber diet is what basically kills you. And the reason is because they've turned food into poison. 
by adding sugar and subtracting fiber. Now, there are other things in food that are a problem too, such as glyphosate and heavy metals and branched-chain amino acids when there are too many, and iron and other things that can cause damage as well. And also the lack of fiber in the food causes changes in intestinal permeability, can lead to irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, um, sepsis, uh, also uh, uh, ultimately can cause uh, psychiatric problems, behavioral health problems, depression, even psychosis, um, depending on exactly what's happened. All of this is, you know, relayed in the book. The point is, Real food doesn't do any of those things. Processed food does. And the reason is because you have flooded the liver and starved the gut. So that's the key to food. And you, you have to learn the difference. Chapter 10, where you speak about foodable, not druggable, and we can talk about those uh, pathologies that are really the expression of an underlying inflammation. But before that, something that really intrigued me was the point that you made about feeding the gut and the microbiome, the microbiota, and the association that has been found with autoimmune conditions. What is the link that you've seen in children, in adult, in adults on the growth, I mean, an, an exponential growth on autoimmune conditions and that lack of food, real food for the microbiome. All right. So there are two things that have gone up unbelievably rapidly in American society. One is food allergy and the other is autoimmune disease. And the question is, where do these come from and why are they going up so, so rapidly, you know, throughout American society? And, you know, the medical establishment isn't, you know, hasn't, you know, given the final word on this. And so I'm not going to tell you I have the final word because, you know, we're just at the beginning of this. But what we do know now is that the intestine is supposed to be a barrier. It's supposed to keep things in. It's supposed to let nutrients cross, but it's not supposed to let other stuff. There's a lot of junk in your intestine, in your gut. There's lipopolysaccharides, there's cytokines, whole bacteria. They're not supposed to get across into your bloodstream, but they are. And we know they are because we can measure it. Now, when those things get across, you set up inflammation. In addition, when those things get across, little pieces of food can get across. And when little pieces of food can get across, your immune system can mount an antibody response against them because they're not supposed to be there. So you basically generate an immune response to various components of food. That can set you up for food allergy. So you can get inflammatory bowel disease. You can get systemic inflammation because your gut's not happy. And we have a name for this general process. It's called leaky gut. Okay, the gut is supposed to be a barrier and somehow it has become leaky. Now, what made it leaky? Many things, but in particular, sugar. Now, why does sugar make the gut leaky? <laughs> and the answer is because when sugar goes through the intestine to get into the bloodstream, it has to be phosphorylated, which therefore reduces the amount of ATP or chemical energy within the cell that weakens the cell and the junctions between the cells that hold them together, that pro provide that barrier called tight junctions. Okay. They become dysfunctional and they separate, they come apart. And so transiently you end up with the ability, with the uh, inability to be able to stop the stuff in the intestine from getting into the bloodstream. And so you can measure lipopolysaccharides, you can measure cytokines, you can measure whole bacteria. You can actually block it with antibiotics. It's one thing that antibiotics do do is they get rid of those. But of course, antibiotics cause other problems and change the, the gut flora. So that's not a good answer. That's not a good long-term answer. The point is we have the data to show that your gut which is supposed to be an impenetrable barrier, is not. And it is through that mechanism that all of these inflammatory processes that we are seeing go up, 
like food allergy, like inflammatory um, bowel disease, like you know systemic inflammation, like autoimmune disease. These are things that are getting worse in part because our intestine is not as competent as it used to be because of our food. When in chapter 10, you talked about those diseases, let's, we've touched a little bit on diabetes, fatty liver, but there is a number of diseases that we as, uh, even if we're physicians, we've always called them diseases, but now the patient, the layman person, we're telling them they're not diseases. Can we in a very easy language explain why they really are not diseases and why food is the treatment rather than drugs? So... <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's talk about the diseases that have gone up in society. Type 2 diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease. These are the diseases that we have ICD-11 codes for. These are the diseases that doctors can bill for. These are not diseases. These are the symptoms of disease. These are actually the manifestations of the underlying problems. The underlying problems are actually what's going on inside the cell to cause these dysfunctions. And I'm going to name the eight that we've identified as a me uh, the medical establishment have identified eight. Now, there's no ICD-9 code for or 11 code for any of them. Doctors don't bill for them, and you've never heard of most of them. Okay, but here they go. Glycation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, membrane instability, inflammation, methylation, and autophagy. These are the subcellular processes that are going on underneath. When these are working for you, you'll be 110 playing tennis. When these are working against you, you'll be 40 in a wheelchair with two stumps on dialysis waiting for your next stroke. That's the difference food can make because food can either be food, and now you're 110 playing tennis, or it can be poison, in which case you're 40 in a wheelchair. All right, and it's all food in between. The reason is because of those eight subcellular pathologies. Now, problem is when you actually examine those subcellular pathologies, or if you examine how they happen, how they work, and what can stop them, it turns out there are no medicines for any of them. There's no medicine for glycation. There's no medicine for oxidative stress. There's no medicine for mitochondrial dysfunction. There's no medicine for insulin resistance. There's no medicine for membrane instability. There's no medicine for inflammation. There's no, there, are, there are ways to cover them up. There are ways to transiently fix them. Like you can take an Aleve for you know, some mild inflammation. But basically, it's like giving an aspirin to a patient with a brain tumor because they have a headache, all right? Might help the headache, not gonna help the brain tumor. So all of the medicines that we throw at all these chronic diseases today, statins and oral hypoglycemic agents and antihypertensives, they're treating the symptoms of disease. They're not actually treating those eight subcellular pathologies because you can't get to them. They're inside the cell, but what can get there is food. Food can treat all of those and effectively. The problem is the food we're eating actually makes them all worse. Our food is poison. Robert, something that you mentioned that I found, uh, it's, it's something that I use quite often. It's not about longevity. It's about how healthy you are as long as you're living. Do you want to be 100 in a wheelchair? That to me is not, I'd rather be dead. It's not quality of life. But looking at that in that, in, in that concept of how long we want to live, a, a, a subject that you really cover well in your book is what does it mean to be healthy? Do you feel that in average, the patient has really lost sight of what feeling good is like? I think there are some people who never felt good. They've never known what feeling good does feel like. And the reason is probably because <clears throat> they've been overwhelmed by processed food from, you know, you know, the earliest ages, even, you know, newborns. Uh, they've never known because they've always had some level of mitochondrial dysfunction. And I can tell you that because I see obese six-month-olds. You know, an obese six-month-olds six -month are not responsible for their dietary choices. The question is, how come those six-month-olds are obese? It's because of what their mothers ate. 
because of what the, passed from the mother via the placenta to the fetus and actually grew the fat and changed the liver metabolism even before that baby was born. That baby's already behind the eight ball. That baby is already a setup for chronic disease. That baby already has mitochondrial dysfunction and that's why the baby's gaining weight so rapidly. Something else that you cover in chapter 15 is about children. And, and as a mom, I'm always interested in all the moms and all of their children and how food is really making our kids less intelligent. We're taking away everything that we want to give them. In, in chapter 15, you talk about uh, cognition, effect. Talk to me a, a little bit about how that sugar that we feel that we are not being good parents, because I've seen this in practice where I'm telling this mom, why are you bringing your daughter to Wendy's? I mean, give me the reasoning because you're the mom. And the answer is like, it makes her happy. How can we s send the message to these parents that that temporary happiness, it really has a trickle down effect? Well, because Coco, it's not happiness. It's pleasure. Pleasure and happiness are not the same. Pleasure is what food will give you. Happiness is what life will give you. So uh, there are seven differences between pleasure and happiness. We've conflated the two. We think that they're the same. They are not. Talk um, about them. I think in Pat Chan's, you go in deep well, in depth into actually, them. Actually, it's my second book, Hacking in the American Mind. All uh, right. But let me seven differences between pleasure and happiness. Number one, pleasure is short lived, like a meal. Happiness is long lived, like a lifetime. Number two, pleasure is visceral. You feel it in your body. Happiness is ethereal. You feel it above the neck. Number three, pleasure is taking, like from a casino. Happiness is giving, like to habitats for humanity. Number four, pleasure is can be achieved with substances. Happiness cannot be achieved with substances. Um, uh, uh, number five, pleasure is, um, uh, there's a number five in there. Oh, pleasure is achieved alone, okay? Like a chocolate cake. Happiness is achieved in social groups, like a party. Number six, the extremes of pleasure, whether it be substances or behaviors. So substances like, cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol, sugar, or behaviors, shopping, gambling, internet gaming, social media, pornography, in the extreme are all addictive. There's an aholic after each one of those, chocoholic, sexaholic, alcoholic, you know, uh, uh, shopaholic, okay? But there's no such thing as being addicted to too much happiness. And finally, number seven, the most important one, Pleasure is dopamine, happiness is serotonin. Two different neurotransmitters, two different areas of the brain, two different sets of receptors, two different regulatory pathways, two different mechanisms of action. So you say, well, like, why do we care? So what? Turns out, the more dopamine, the less serotonin. The more pleasure you seek, the more unhappy you get. And so you can end up in this vicious spiral trying to chase your, quote, happiness, except it's not happiness. You're chasing your pleasure in an attempt to try to fill your happiness, but it's not working. And this is the basis of addiction and also depression. So in a way, when we feel that we are making our children happy, yet we are just giving them pleasure we are setting them up for failure, which uh, it, it brings up another point in your book that it talks about one generation at the time. Because when, when I started reading your book, it's like uh, I was so excited. And when uh, there is progress, I can see there is progress. But when do you feel that our children and how do our children play a role, play a role into this change? And when do you see society and industry in general going to understanding and accept it? Yes. We have to change the way we eat if we want to stay healthy. Well, I will tell you that the processed food industry has basically done everything it can to try to, you know, uh, negate or deep six this message because, you know, this is an attack on their money generation. You know, this is where they get their profits. 
you know, the annual profit margin of the food industry went from 1% per year before they started adding sugar to the food to 5% per year. This is their juggernaut. This is their gravy train. They don't want to stop because this is how they got rich. <clears throat> so <clears throat> they are not on board. Having said that, the last 40 to 50 years, we've now recognized that what we've done has not worked. All right. And things are just getting worse. And people are understanding that. And actually, the food industry is understanding that. And there are some food industry concerns. There are some companies that are trying to now act responsibly. It is very difficult. They face an uphill battle. I'm helping two of them. For no money, by the way. Um, I'm doing it purely, you know, to try to fix the world, not because I'm making any money at it. So, you know, no, no arguments from your uh, listeners about can selling. We, can we ask what uh, companies are or is that oh, still? No, you... Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But that's, that's very exciting. And I know that you don't write books to make money. Anybody who's an author, myself included, we never write a book to, to earn money. It's really because... There are other ways to earn money than writing books. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But it's so encouraging to have people just as yourself, deep researchers, very curious person. And I love your book because it has a hint of sense of humor that I just, I see your quirkiness and just, it makes me smile chapter after chapter. Well, thank you. But that's my editor. Amy. Well, then you have a very quirky Amy. I like that. I like that. But over, overall, the context is so easy to understand. It brings down to earth the fact that, yes, we can take control from our lives and our food. Any final thoughts you'd like to wrap up this beautiful interview that you've given us? <clears throat> so here's the way to think about this. You have a wasp in your attic. What are you going to do? You're going to kill the wasp? Or are you going to find the wasp's nest? To solve a problem, you have to work upstream of the problem. Working downstream of the problem only fixes the result. It doesn't fix the cause. If you only fix the result, the cause is still there. And if the cause is still there, it's still a problem. And that's what's been going on for the last 50 years. And we haven't solved the problem. And sadly, we keep getting sick because there are more and more wasps. It's time to solve the problem. Dr. Robert Lustig, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for spending the time for helping us uh, understand the underlying, the true underlying causes of our health. And to, as I say in my channel, say no to the medical sentencing. If you have a medical sentence, you have to say no and look for the wasp. Where is the nest and how we can work on the cause? Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Coco. You're welcome.